Uh, thank you for all coming. Uh, normally I do this type of presentations uh, in the mountains, uh, behind my, safely behind my screen. Yeah. So this is a little bit getting used to again, like having all these people in front of me. Um, the theme of this week is abundance. And um, when I thought about it, like what is abundance for me? Or what could it be? Um, is this abundance? These people kind of going and shopping and then uh, with the abundance of uh, useful or maybe useless stuff they can buy in the shops and then they go to their abundant supermarket with this abundance of plastic to kind of then reside in their maybe not so abundant homes. Is this kind of the way we want to live? I don't know. Maybe I'll come back to it later. My name is Jeroen Spoelstra. Um, I used to be a product designer way back. And I moved from being a product designer to being a design teacher to kind of a, a human design practice, practitioner uh, to life center design. And today I'm going to tell you a little bit about that journey and what life center design entails for me. And this is kind of a part of my happy place. <laughs> this is my shed. Uh, and I use that shed for my bike business that I also run, like a mountain bike guiding business, and to make things. Uh, and my philosophy with that shed is that I, everything, everything that kind of I bring in that, to that shed, a part of, from the bike, but that's also going to change, has been used before by someone else, so that I can then make it into a thing of myself. And this is where I live. This is Usana, and this is our house. Uh, and we live with, there with 30 people. Um, and four of us, is like we are four of the, those people because we have like a, a family of four. Uh, and the back side is my playground. Um, we, if you look to this side, there's a big lake that's now dry. And to that side, there's the French border and the purity. Um, and this is also where the inspiration comes from, come from for life and design for me. I moved there uh, five years ago um, because my wife couldn't live in in the Netherlands, she's from Costa Rica, so could, that was an opportunity for us to kind of change our lives. It was just before Corona, and like, she's a graphic designer, I used to do design thinking and humans and design. Before Corona, online design thinking difficult, so we started with graphic design. But due to Corona, we felt like, hey, um, maybe we should kind of like incorporate nature in our work more, and how can we do that? And then we stumbled upon life and design, and there was nothing about that yet in 2019, 2020. There were some articles, um, there were some design principles, but it was not, not an approach. There was not a lot of people kind of working in it. So I was like, well, let's just start. Uh, and now we are a team of four. So um, what started as a, a studio that kind of is pretty much focused on the northern part of Europe, uh, especially the Netherlands because I had my network there, is now uh, I'm the only northern European. Uh, Marx is from Costa Rica. Alejandra is from Spain, also from the north part of Spain, and uh, Alberto is from Peru. So now suddenly we have like a pluriverse uh, uh, team, uh, and we work kind of like semi-remotely. Because uh, Alberto lives in Rome, um, and he, f he also lives in Peru part of the time, so we kind of try to um, do, sometimes he comes here to, to our place, but like we mostly do it remotely. And this is our dog, Jago. So what is life set design? Um, to me, it's a design philosophy and approach that goes beyond human needs, where human set design focuses on the needs and uh, maybe more the wishes of humans. Uh, life set design goes beyond that, to really put the life in the center of our creation. Um, and it advocates for biological ecosystems and, and non-users, a little bit the underdogs in the in a society. Um, and there are many. Um, and the long-term goal, I believe, is kind of to restore uh, the bio biological ecosystems and kind of restore the balance between humanity and nature. But we are a part of nature, but we kind of lost that. And this was the very first visual I made around life and design. To kind of get ahead, it's a little bit, well, it's, not maybe, it's, it's kind of the world kind of divided in three layers. We have a, the, the, the green one is like a biological ecosystem. Uh, the red one is the human ecosystem, and the purple one is the digital ecosystem. 
Um, before the Middle Ages, on this side, we were part of nature, and then we kind of started to kind of make our own tools, and then we kind of separated ourselves a little bit from, from nature, and we created our own ecosystem. And that became bigger and bigger and bigger. While that became bigger, the nature became smaller. And that kind of, we, we speeded it up rapidly kind of in the last century. And then in Corona, in 1946, the first computer came to life, and that kind of started off a digital ecosystem as well. And that kind of, with Corona, that kind of speeded up, and that takes huge amounts of energy. And basically, those two ecosystems are crashing down on the biological one. Um, and there, the, for me, the reason to start with life and design is going, how can we restore with design, be part of the, the solution, um, the biological ecosystems, and just kind of look way beyond the human needs of, of what we're creating. <coughs> and for me, that's about like designing from different perspectives, not only from the human perspective, but also from the nature perspective, maybe from the perspective of a building. Um, the perspective of a street, um, just way, trying to look from different, through different eyes, um, focused on longevity. Um, a lot of what we do today is kind of about convenience. We want it now, and, or we want it even yesterday, and it has to, it makes us, needs to make us feel happy for like a short amount of time. Um, and that's also how we design. But we maybe have to think about future generations, um, and for future generations to live, we need nature to thrive. Um, life design is more holi is holistic and systemic, where human centered design also talks about holism. Um, that's really focused on the human holistic point of view, where we kind of have to include way more the, the planet and life on Earth. And there's a universal responsibility for the things we do and buy. Um, yes, I still have an iPhone. Maybe next time I won't. Or I buy an I, and this one I bought new. Maybe the next time I, I buy a refurbished one. You know what new? What's new for me? Maybe secondhand for someone else, but that's fine. Uh, but the impact of be, by me buying this phone is that someone in Taiwan or China has to make that maybe 14 hours a day. You know, these phones. What's the effect on that family life of that person? I have to think about these things when we design. Um, and life design is about doing good for nature and for humans. If there's no nature, we can't thrive, we can't live in the future. Um, just to show kind of a little bit the complexity of things, I did this visualization about the greenhouse gas emissions in the plastic value chain back in 2020. Um, and it's really difficult to kind of figure out like how much kind of like, because everyone wants to be like CO2 ne neutral and we have to kind of go move down with the greenhouse gas emissions. But it's virtually impossible to do that with the way we live at the moment. We put so much kind of like pollution in the air just by using plastics. Um, so we have to rethink a lot of the things we do, and I think design can help. Uh, a beautiful example of how design, I think, is helping our, our entrepreneurship is kind of the Vega project. This is a, a sneaker brand that kind of from the get-go uh, put like, um, the user, the, 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 not only the end user, but like the people that make the shoes, the nature um, into consideration. The shoes are made in Brazil. The cotton they use, they kind of really kind of go with, they work together with the farmers to make sure that the farmers kind of have not only a good wage, but also that the land is taken care of in a good way. <coughs> and even the logistics are being taken care of by a social enterprise in Paris. So it's all kind of intertwined. And what, even more, they're transparent of what they do, and they're transparent of what they but went wrong. So if there's something wrong, they share it. <coughs> and why do we need a, um, life in design now? Because basically our impact is too big. <coughs> this is a, a, a beach in, in an island in Indonesia, and it's kind of a little trough for all the plastic from a river that from other island kind of washes down, and every day this flushes up. And this is drinking plastic uh, cups for water. And so the experience is just like you rip up the top, you drink it for in one second, and then you throw it away. And I believe that like life's in this, it's time for life in design, uh, also in, to incorporate in organizations because like uh, more and more people demand change in the way we work. The new employees of the future, the students from today, demand. Uh, company or work environment that's more just, more inclusive, more sustainable. Um, 
and we have to, del we have to deliver on that. <coughs> um, this is us in our mountain office. <laughs> um, but that comes with a, with, a, with, a, with, with, with a different mindset, with something with, with different, looking through different eyes. Um, you know, as designers, I feel we have to way more kind of like question the relevance of what we design. Uh, and it's also sometimes difficult because you also have to make a living, uh, especially when you're a freelance or entrepreneur. Um, but can you kind of like or push back your clients or can you work with your clients like, hey, what we have to design, if this is the questions I get, I think we have to be more sustainable, more just, and I think we can do it in this way and you can still have a good product or service. Um, we have to way more think into kind of placing nature in the center of what we design in, in the decision-making table. Um, <coughs> facilitate collaborative processes. We already do that a lot with human-centered design and with co-design, uh, but still a lot of like, the design processes are tiered to a kind of a product that needs to sell a lot of uh, sell a lot of times. Uh, there's always kind of a client at the end that kind of decides. Um, can we design things that kind of restore and regenerate instead of destroy? Um, and I think what designers should do is take kind of like an, uh, uh, create like different future scenarios. If I Google future, and this is what I get. It's blue, it's white, it's artificial, it's non-exist, you know, it's, 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 um, but this is kind of the images we portray, kind of, we, we, we design as designers, we create as designers to kind of create future scenarios, and to say, okay, this is, how, this is what we're gonna, gonna work, work to. While, this might also be the future. This is a, uh, an image from the Rewilding uh, Europe Initiative, and I really like it because it kind of like, shows the journey of, 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 of where we are now. Like here, this is kind of where we are now. We know it's all brown and on the land. And, and, but we can like, learn from this, take this part, and, and integrate it in our current life. And what I also like about Rewilding Europe is that it's about Europe. You know, a lot of, still a lot of things when I come, like, oh, we have to kind of uh, restore biodiversity, or we have to kind of like, uh, set off CO2. Let's do that in Africa, or let's do that in, you know, there's this kind of, we have to de decolonize these things as well, and really work on, like, how can we do that in Europe, before we kind of tell someone in Africa how to do it. <coughs> so back to abundance. Um, maybe this is way more abundant. This is Costa Rica, um, which is also under threat, because of that underabundance that I showed in the beginning. Um, or this is abundance. And this is my backyard. Um, <coughs> you still can question if this is kind of a good way to kind of like enjoy the mountains. Uh, but it's just kind of the abundance of like open views, silence, this kind of thing. So let's have a look. I talked about human centered design before. Let's have a little look about like what's the difference between life centered design and human centered design. Human centered design is moving inward. And thanks to Xavier, who's also in the uh, watching today, here today, kind of we created this kind of image like in the beginning of the year. Um, it's about human centered design at the end is what I want, not about what I need. Or the client will tell you, I need to, I, we need to create a new product and we need to sell that. So it's about what people want or what I want to sell, not what people really need. And we have to go to what is needed, um, excluding animals. Is human centered design, including animals, life centered design, uh, power and hierarchy, there's a difference there. Uh, we have to move from less life, so more on our phone, uh, to more life, less on our phone. Um, as long as we're only designed for hum humanity, we, it's kind of it stays de degenerative and we move to move to a regenerative uh, future. And it's short term thinking via long term thinking. A few examples. Um, Let's say this whole thing is your ecosystem of your organization. Um, what an organization used to look at is just our stakeholders uh, and kind of make them, have, make them satisfied, make them happy. Um, but there's a whole ecosystem behind it of uh, nature, like the species, the habitat, the resources, and also the non-user non communities. So these are opportunities to kind of be more sustainable or more re regenerative, work with them and kind of include them in your design process. 
beautiful example is the faith in nature. They actually took nature into their boardroom. And they did, didn't take that lightly. They kind of talked with, like, uh, with lawyers and uh, looked into kind of the, the legal system, how they could do that. So that the decisions they make, um, nature has a saying in that. <coughs> this is a beautiful square in Saragossa. Um, there's a few plants here, trees here, and a few here. It was pretty poorly, and we kind of like did a workshop there to kind of like see what we could do to kind of create more space for that nature. If the nature, if that, if those trees were in the right place, if there's like, um, uh, um, if they were happy or not, or so we created a non-human persona of that, of that, of the, of those trees and of that square, uh, and give that back to the local uh, community in Saragossa to kind of see, hey, what can we do together? Uh, to create more space. And what you see, if you design for nature, you also design for, human, for humans. Because like, the result of having more green spaces in the city is that people can go more connect with nature, with their environment, um, and also have more clean air. <coughs> so we have to move from like, is this the classic Maslow pyramid that I, in this image I kind of stole from Case Klomp and made it my own. Um, Instead of like putting the material needs kind of as the base, and that's kind of like the core thing, um, we should kind of maybe put natural needs and the communal needs kind of in, in the core, and have these things just kind of, and have the material needs to follow. Beautiful example, I think, uh, in the Netherlands are the pollinators. Um, they're able to kind of create a community um, around biodiversity and about food forest. Um, in a really fun way. So design for me is also fun and nice and like it has to be kind of in a positive. And um, so throughout the Netherlands, they kind of organize tree fest to kind of plant trees to help food forests. I think um, just in November, they did that whole thing. In spring, they do a biodiversity uh, campaign uh, for bees. Uh, and they include kind of fa whole families, they include companies. And it's kind of like a, a movement that kind of really kind of like practiced uh, and uh, like uh, a life-centered way of, of thinking. And I think we have to move from less life, just being our, f a lot of the things that we design today, or also that we maybe demand, or what, or what, and what, what companies kind of give us, are things that kind of like are convenient, are kind of to make life easier for us. But maybe um, we need more life. Maybe it needs to be a little less convenient and more out, more out there. What I feel like when I moved from the city to this, to, to, to this little village, in the city, my, my life, or my, my entertainment is outsourced. You know, I go shopping, I go uh, to theater, I go to the, the club, uh, whatever. It's all kind of outsourced. My entertainment in, the, in where I live is kind of like coming together with the community, creating a, a dinner together with the community, uh, walking into nature. So it's really more kind of what I, I'm going to create something so that I can entertain myself or I can relax. Um, so we have to move from products that steal life, and in, in not, only by, not only by creation, but also in the use, to kind of products that heal life, um, both in creation and use. And that's not kind of a black and white thing, because it's impossible to kind of like, for now, um, have an electric car that goes, is, is regenerative but we can create, like, we go from big agriculture to kind of regenerative agriculture. We can go from, like, just using concrete and steel and plastic for building houses to kind of bio-based or a healthy mix of recycled materials. Like, uh, the Hof van Cartes is, I think, a good example of kind of how to try to kind of be circular uh, and regenerative. Solar panels, they're practical because they are in a, in a way that they don't use kind of... Um, uh, you know, they, they just use sun, but to make them, it's still kind of like uh, bad for the planet. But that's kind of maybe we have to kind of think about how to kind of make that, improve that. Fairphone is, a, I think, a great example of, of, of how you can really look into kind of the community, into kind of nature, and kind of move forward uh, in a life-centered way. But for me, it's weird that kind of companies like Vodafone or, or T-Mobile don't include these type of phones in their offerings, or at least not in Spain, what I can see. And I think we should kind of maybe have less design sprints and more design walks. <laughs> um, 
And I'm not sure if that's because I live in nature now that I kind of here. Okay. Uh, it's not maybe because I live in nature now um, that everything moves slower, but maybe we have to cons be more considerate about the things we design. And we don't need to, I used to kind of like put like, uh, if I did a workshop, I put like, I don't know how much candy kind of in, these, in, in my in participants to get them like super hyper and, uh, and <laughs> so they spit out as many ideas as possible. <laughs> um, but now when I, I want to, I want to kind of design with my team, I go outside. I don't need an energizer because we kind of are in the, in the right energy when we're, at the moment we're going outside. And we have considered talks. And we, and we write down and we, and we draw, but in a slower pace. And we let ideas sink and we pick them up two weeks later. Um, to kind of make sure that the kind of the ideas we work on, that they're more considerate. In the last week I had like students from Fundamentals Academy and I just taught, I taught them, go, go for a hike and ideate. And I don't want 60 IDs. I want five. But I want five good, you know, five ones, five that are kind of considered, that we thought about, um, and that showed in the result. Another thing, so there's a user experience, and often that's pretty short. But on the back side of the user experience is someone, is a non-user experience. Example, um, the village where I live is very beautiful. My, my neighbors lived there for five, six, seven generations, I don't know. Very old house, very beautiful garden. In the summer, it's very touristic. So a lot of people walk into that garden and sometimes even walk into that house. If that happens once, that's fine. You know, that's kind of like, it's an, for, the tourist, for, the, for the tourists, it's like an encounter of one minute. If that happens the whole summer, that's a thousand people walking through your garden. When we don't think about these things, I and mean, when we design for a tourist destination, we don't think about the effects what happens in the local community. Same happens with the nature experience. If I want to make a fire from, I cut down one tree, I have to dry the tree a bit, but then I have maybe like a, like a three hours, or three hour of fire, let's say that. But that open space in the forest takes maybe 50 years, 100 years, or even longer to grow back. That doesn't say that we don't can cut the tree, but uh, a, a forester friend of mine in, in Ainsa says like, when I, and he way, is really focused on, on bringing biodiversity back in also these kind of agroforestal places. It's like, when I cut a tree, I think about, I think through the eyes of the forest. I think in the time of the forest, and then I'm gonna cut it. Because then I need to find, if I maybe cut this one, then like at least other species can, can thrive or grow. <coughs> Life's a design process when I started, and then you can go really wild, I think uh, Jim, you were you joined. I did like a, a tool test the other day, and Jim joined also in the process. So we tried to kind of design everything kind of as open as possible. Um, and then I came up with a process that's maybe not that much different from the Stanford design thinking process. Um, but it's what's more, what happens in the process? So it's like uh, we have to empathize with the ecosystem way more. So that's kind of including the life. When we define something, we have to really define into system, systemic challenges. Um, we have a lot of online discussions about the, the double diamond and if that's useful or not. And um, what I discover is that when you, look, when you design for a system, there's never one problem statement. There's always more problem statements. And that made me think back to my product design years when you are t taught to, to make, in, when you do a, when you, design for a product, you have to think about all these different elements that come where, that, that are in a product. Cost price, shape, uh, material use, production. There's a, a lot of different uh, problem statements to solve. And actually the same happens with um, life and design. And may, maybe design thinking or human centered design became a little bit too much kind of there's one clear uh, problem statement and we're gonna solve that. And if we solve that, then we have so we solved everything. Then I believe that we have to kind of design collaboratively with nature, in co-design with nature, and in co-design with the community. Um, when we've done that and we've tested it, things in the wild, we, you have to iterate, kind of the, the, the idea. But iterate in a conscious way, uh, because iterating can also lead to kind of like more efficiency that's maybe not needed to kind of really uh, help the planet forward. And then it has to kind of come to life, then your design. 
And regeneration is not a fixed thing at the start when it has to be regenerated, but it should be kind of a goal to kind of like see where, how much can we regenerate and how much can we not regenerate and what, but, but how can we make the impact as, less, uh, as little as possible. So what do I do at the moment? So this year I've been doing, trying to kind of think about all these things. And until June, I didn't really have an offering or, so I was just kind of experimenting, developing. Um, <clears throat> and now with our team, we're kind of more close to kind of what we think we should do as, uh, as a studio and also with the, with, the, with the skills we have. So we do one part education, it's also because I kind of had one foot in education always and I like to kind of uh, work with people. And we're gonna do like a life design fundamental scores, um, creating non-human personas, and there will be a retreat in the mountains. Um, and we do that on the umbrella of the Lifestyle Design School, uh, <coughs> which will kind of start in, so we, look, we will launch the school next week or the week after, and then the program starts in January. Um, next to that, we do workshops, but it's um, where we help organizations and teams understand the impact on their ecosystem and create sustainable and regenerative strategies. Again, maybe not too wild when it comes to kind of like business models or totally new things, but kind of the lives and design is already pretty new, so we want to kind of keep it close to what we, what we know. Um, and but what we do, and what I also did with students when I worked at the half year, when there was an opportunity to take students outside, take them outside. So when there's an opportunity to kind of take workshop participants outside, go outside because that's where life happens, not only for humans and design, but also for lives and design. <coughs> And we want to start something with an open and beta studio challenges, similar to open IDEO. So we want to kind of take on like a crowdsourcing way of designing solutions in a life center design way. And that's kind of under development. And we did one before, and that was with our local um, community in AINSA. AINSA has a really big kind of net red natura uh, um, space, <laughs> and this is the Quaranta Huesos, also known as the Lammergeier, and he is a, he's a bone eater. So when the vultures are gone, he comes in um, and he eats, the, he eats the bones, crushes the bones. Um, so the question was, like, we have this big Red Natura area, but we want to kind of increase it and we want to kind of thrive, have to thrive it more. Uh, but how can we do that while there's still agriculture there and there's tourism and there's people living? Um, because we are the size of where we live, the area is the size of the, the province of Utrecht, and there's 8,000 people. Eight. There used to be 20, and now it's 8,000 8, people. In the summer, there might be 20,000 20, 20, again. Um, but how can we kind of, beyond tourism, um, make sure that this community and the econo economy, economy is also thriving? Um, so basically, we kind of invited everyone, like as many people from what we could find from different types of stakeholders, hunters, uh, organic farmers, non -organic, traditional farmers, tourist, traditional tourism, uh, ecotourism, everyone, we invited them in uh, for a few sessions. Um, first of all, we kind of had them kind of uh, via interviews and um, kind of together kind of create like the design challenges. And then on every topic, we had several design challenges and they kind of together, we created kind of a whole array of solutions. <coughs> and that's it. That's it. Um, I think design should way more uncover the things we don't do and we don't know. Um, and I think it's our universal responsibility to kind of show a future in which nature and life on our planet get a strong voice um, and where we connect to to nature again. And also if we connect to nature again and we have more space for nature, then we have our own future back. Thank you. <laughs>